want you to see the strength of words, the power of words. Um, we have two situations, which I don't know the facts on either one, where two men were shot in their car by police. Now, I've heard the story of one, he was, he was a repeated criminal, he had a whole history of things that uh, led up to where he was, and some of them are, some of the list are pedophilia, and, you know, and uh, murder, and, and uh, people cried out, he was such a nice boy, he was such a nice, you know, it, it's amazing. And, and I can't defend it one way or another, because I wasn't there, but maybe, maybe that was excessive to kill him. And then the other case, the, as I understand it now, the man was asked several times to raise his hands. And, and I've experienced something like this. I, I was working for a, a company. Um, uh, I, was the, I, I was becoming the district manager of the Midwest for this company. And I was having to move to Chicago. And I didn't end up ever moving there. I, the other company that I worked for offered me more money to come back to work for them, so I went back to work for them. It was, uh, we, I went there with, with uh, the owner's son, and we were driving around Chicago. We got there at 1 o'clock in the morning, and we didn't know our way around, and we knew where we needed to get. This was before GPS or anything. We knew where we needed to get, and it was right across the interstate. It was right on the other side of the interstate. Yeah, we couldn't find a road that went that way. All the roads were one way the other way. And we're like, we're lost. We don't know how to get over there. We can see the hotel where we're supposed to go, but we can't get there. So we thought, well, we'll just take this quick little run on, you know, a short one-way bridge that's 1 o'clock in the morning. Nobody's out. We'll take this short run and go to the hotel. And we just we just got about halfway across it. You know, and, and they forced us to come back to the other side, the wrong side. And, um, and the driver got out. He was, you know, the policeman asked him to get out of the car. He was, uh, he asked, you know, he was getting his license and all that, explaining his situation. It was very nice. He had a boy from Nebraska, you know, I thought I'd get out and talk to the other policeman. So I started to get out of the car just to say, hey, you know, what's going on? We're here from Nebraska. And this guy suddenly draws his gun slams his arm down over the top of the car. He was he was in the he was standing just outside the passenger side of the of the car. And he just slammed his arm on top of the car with the gun pointing directly at me and said, get back in the car, do not and and I like, whoa, what kind of world is this? But their world is, you know, one o'clock in the morning, I'm getting out of the car. He doesn't want me to get out of the car. He never said don't get out of the car. They never told me not to get out of the car. I was just going to go talk to him find out about Chicago. Well, I found about Chicago, and uh, I didn't want any part of Chicago. But I understand that that guy was immediately, in a sense, threatened. I could have a gun. I could have drawn down on it. We could have done all that on purpose just to shoot the cop. We could have been criminals running away from something and going down the one-way street to escape. You know, all these kind of things that were going through their minds. They don't know what's going on. They just put their life on the line every day. And it's getting worse and worse. That was 20 years ago or 30 years ago. I mean, that was, you know, and it just shocked me. I mean, just his arm came down. You could just hear the thud on top of the car as, as he pointed the gun at me. And I got right back in the car. But um, it's, it, it's, it's interesting. And um, it, it's... But I want to talk to you about the power of the word. You know, I don't know this the second situation. I just know that the girl videoed it and that sort of thing. And uh, possibly uh, chose when she started her camera. I, I don't know what happened exactly. But as I understand it, he was told to raise his hands. I don't know if he was asked to get out of He was told to raise his hands. And rather than that, he went for his billfold. Unfortunately, and I'm not sure why he went for his identification. I don't, I don't know. But, um, but they told him to raise his hands, and he went for his GoPro. And at the same time, he made the mistake of telling him that he had a gun. Now maybe he said, "I have a permit to carry, and I have a gun." You know, trying to be 
all innocent. It sounds like he was a pretty innocent kind of a guy. I don't know, but uh, but the fact that he and suddenly the policeman is thinking this guy's gonna, you know, it's it's very quick. You know, you don't have a lot of decision time because in just a few seconds you're going to be at the short end of this thing instead of the long end of this thing. And maybe maybe he responded wrong, but the power of the work. It, it has disrupted our nation. It has disrupted our nation. Um, how many people do you think I killed in Chicago this weekend through various crimes and different things? It was in the 30s. It was in the 30s because of crime in Chicago. 38, I think, was the number of people who died in Chicago this weekend. And because of crimes, you know, shooting each other, igniting each other, beating each other to death. Did you hear about any of those? You didn't hear about a single one of those. Because it doesn't make the news. See, it's about the dollar. For the media, it's about the dollar. They don't care what they're doing to this nation. And maybe, maybe you could be conspiracy theorists and say it's something bigger than that. I know there's a conspiracy, and, and the leader of that conspiracy's name is Lucy. But there is a conspiracy to destroy mankind. But I don't know that the media has a conspiracy or anything like that. They just know there's ratings, and what they put on the news gets them dollars. And gets them dollars for advertising as their ratings go up. So it may not be even motivated by some sort of deep liberal conspiracy. It may simply be motivated by money. But, but the power of the word, and suddenly they have a whole nation of people that are marching. A whole nation of people that are that are, are you know pickety and and, uh, and and doing all kinds of crazy things and uh, we we were affected by it when we came to the movie Friday night we couldn't come the way we normally come because at 120 the center these people decided to go out and have a protest and 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 honestly you know they block streets they you know I, I don't you know they didn't do anything that I could do. If I decided to go and block the streets and stand up in the middle of the 120th Center and block traffic and stuff, somebody would come and arrest me. And they'd take me away to Tom's place. You know, and, and these people can do that because the media has swayed this because, you know what, if I can take this incident and make it a big thing and make lots of ratings off of it, then I can take that incident will cause a bigger incident, which it did in Dallas. And then I'll get better ratings, and I'll have everybody watching my channel because I'm the first guy on the spot. And whether they intentionally do it, I don't know. But I know that, I guess intentionally, to the point of, of ratings and, and dollars. <clears throat> but it's causing disruption in our nation. And, and really, by and large, our nation is a pretty good place to live. And... Um, and our president has just come out and said that it's getting so bad that they're going to have to do something. They're not sure to what extreme they're going to have to do something. It, it's come about because of what they did. And it's the power of the word. You understand? It's the power of the word. They said, this is what happened. It wasn't true. You didn't have all the facts. But it, it swayed the people. And the people respond. This isn't right. This isn't fair. This is wrong. And and maybe it is. I'm not trying to defend or, or not defend either side. Of it. What I'm trying to say is that the power of the word is so powerful. And we have the power of the word in us on the positive side, on the God side. And we don't realize the power of our words. The power of words. God spoke all creation into existence by word. It doesn't say that he built this or made that or constructed it. He spoke it into existence, and then he gave us that power. He gave us Christians that power. He gave mankind that power. And man speaks negativeness into the situation, and more negativeness results. So what do we do as Christians in this situation? See, that's what we, we need to speak. We need to speak not what we experience. Remember I just said that. I said... I said, our experiences do not change the Word of God, but the Word of God will change our experiences in life, right? Absolutely. What does the Word of God say? 
how are we supposed to talk about this? See, the enemy would have the church, our words are more powerful, he knows our words are more powerful than the lost. We have the very creative power of God in us. And so what do you say? See, what do you say? If we don't know this, and I know it represents a lot of work, I know it represents a lot of time, but if we don't know this, and we operate out of our experience, and we speak out of our experience, instead of what this word says. You know, some people say, oh, our nation's going to hell in the handbasket. This is just terrible. This is awful. Our nation is... That's what they want you to say. They want you to say that. They want you to say it because then it brings them more power. Because then they can begin to collectively, you know, martial law, whatever they want to take guns away, whatever they do, it gives them power. They want you to speak this insanity. But what does the Word of God say about us in our lives? I can't influence thousands and thousands of people. I know people try and do that through these protests and that sort of thing. And the media tries to do it. I can't do that. But I can certainly influence my own life and my family's life by how I speak about these situations. Now I can say, oh, the end times are coming. It's, you know, it's really pointing towards the end times. That could be, and, and as we go through Revelations, I can show you things about that. That could be, but, but what is the situation to me? I'm protected by God. I'm a child of God. Fear has no place in me. God didn't give me a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. See, Satan works on fear because it's the opposite of faith. For every truth there is of God, Satan has an opposite false mind. For word, the word of God is the very operation of how we should operate our lives, the, the very context of what we should think and do. And then Satan has a little L to it, makes it world. He has a little L, I think, for lie. And he calls it world. And people, then they don't operate their lives based on the word of God. They operate their lives based on world experience. World experience. And it's so important that we don't do that. God has love. And what is love? Love is, is the giving of myself totally to somebody else. Giving whatever sacrifice I need to make. I say I love my grandkids. I'll make whatever sacrifice necessary for the love of my grandkids. I'll make every sacrifice necessary for the love of my wife. That, that's love. Now, I don't have love until God gives me love. I love because he first loved me. I love God because he first loved me. In first John. I love because he first loved me. I, I get love because he's dwelling within me. Now, there's there's worldly love, which has lots of different Greek words, and I won't go into that. But agape is godly love. I have godly love because of who God is in me. And I love others because of that. Satan has a lie, and he calls it lust. He calls it lust. And that's, that's a, a worldly form of, of love. That's why there's so many marriages that fall apart because it was the, the foundation was based on love, on lust, a physical attraction of someone and not really realizing, you know, what am I doing here? What's going on here? I get this physical relationship with this person before we're married. And then, and, and then when I, we finally get married, I don't understand why it falls apart because it was never based on love. It was based on lust. And that's Satan's lie. I, I can go through a whole list. But for faith, Satan has fear. It's the opposite of, it's the opposite of faith. Faith is trusting in God that, that he is going to honor his word. And his word is even above his name, as we said in Psalm 138 too. His name is, is above every other name. But his word, he says, he exalts his word above his name. And we, church, don't know his word. We don't know his word. And if, and if I was ever to, to, to preach hellfire and brimstone or whatever, or, or a critical sermon, I think it would be on the Word of God. We don't know His Word. We don't know how to respond to our situations because we don't know His Word. And we need to know that. Because we can influence many other lives. We can influence the lives of our children. We can influence how they think going forth in the future. We can influence the people we work with. We can influence our relatives. You know, how do you how do you do that? How do you do that? You do that by knowing what the Word of God says. 
And, and because we don't know the Word of God, we speak our experiences instead. If somebody is, 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 is ill in our family, the first thing, what do the doctors say? What does the Word of God say about my brother? He said, well, you're, you're going to end up being Pollyannish, Pastor. You're going you're to tell me to speak the Word of God into this person's life, and then what if they still don't? Well, in reality, all the people Jesus healed, where are they? They all died. All the people he brought back from the dead, they all died. So, so why would I speak the negative crud into these situations? Why speak that? And, and Karen, you experienced that. You, you got to a point, you said, I'm not going to speak this negative junk anymore, right? I'm just not. Even though this is how I feel, this is what I'm experiencing, what does the Word of God say about me? And that's what we have to do. And is it Pollyannish? I, I don't know. But I know it's the Word of God, and that's what I'm going to speak into my life. And I'm going to speak that into the life of my grandchildren. I'm going to speak it into my nation. We aren't losing this nation. There is going to be a great revival. We have a promise. The harvest is bountiful. And what we need to do, see so what the enemy wants us to do, is he wants us to become preppers. He wants us to hide away. He wants us to, to, to you know, respond different. Oh, the nation is, oh, you know. Because the enemy wants us to do that. Because he knows the power of our words. We can speak I know you may say the next one. But I, I can speak to the weather. I believe I can speak to the weather. Now, Jesus spoke about the weather. He says, you guys, you Pharisees, you know how to predict the weather and everything else, but you don't know the Word of God. Now, isn't that interesting? You know how to predict the weather, but you don't know the Word of God. He, you know, he said, when the sun is red, then this is going to happen. Remember that text? I, I don't remember it exactly, but... But he says, you can predict the weather, but you don't even know. He did, they knew they were the leaders of their religion. And they were standing in the very presence of the triune God, Jesus Christ, coming, Emmanuel, come incarnate. He was God standing there in front of them. They were the leaders of their denomination of Jerusalem at the time. And he says, you know how to predict the weather, you don't know, you don't know me. You don't know the word. We become experts at predicting the weather. We have weathermen that are paid to predict the weather. And, you know, they get us, you know, pretty close most of the time. Yeah, I always get, yeah, it's going to be hot in summer. Oh, gee, I thought it was cold in summer. You know, I, I mean, there, there's, a, there's really a, kind of a nonsense to it all, really, when you get right down to it. And, and, but we claim to it, we watch, what's it going to be like tomorrow? What, is it going to rain tomorrow? I don't know. Do you want it to rain tomorrow? You're a Christian. Do you need rain? Do you want some rain on your grass? Rain. He says, no rain. He'll rain very isolated. Do you want any rain on your yard? I, I mean, it, it sounds goofy to you, maybe, that I speak like that. But, but we have the power of the Word, and it just can begin by it can begin by speaking positive things into our situations instead of negative things. Because what we have to do is, okay, there's a lot of fear out there right now, so how do, what do I do to combat fear? Do I jump in with them? Do I jump in with them? Oh, I'm not afraid. I'm a Christian. But but I have a fear for this nation. I have a fear for my grandkids. I have a fear. Do I jump in with that? No, I don't jump in with that. I'm a child of God. I can, I can speak things into existence. They can speak things into existence. We're in the trouble that we're in in this nation today because of what people have spoken into our nation. What have they spoken into their children's lives? It started back in the 60s. What did they speak? What did they speak into lives? And what have we got as a result of it? I remember as a kid, I was a, a, a bus boy at the Lamplighter Motor Inn, and there was a there was a waiter there, and he happened to come from France, and he had a little, he spoke pretty good English, but a little bit of an accent. And, um, and we're all adults here, so I'll, I'll tell you what he said to me. I was 14 years old, I was busting tables. He was talking about sleeping with this woman that he was dating. And I'm like, boy, I was raised Catholic. I, I knew that was bad. I just, that was not good. You're going to get yourself in big trouble. That is, I don't understand it all, but that's not good. You know, that was the way I was raised. 
that was not good. And he said to me, this is what he said to me, he says, well, do you ever buy a pair of shoes without trying them on first? I still remember that from 14 years old. Do you ever buy a pair of shoes without trying them on first? What, what does the Word of God say? The Word of God says you do that, and you're going to have problems in your marriage life if you ever, or your, your relational life if you ever do that. You're going to have problems because of that. That's what the Word of God says. Now, maybe, <coughs> maybe what he said makes perfect sense to him, but it doesn't line up with the Word of God. The Word of God is what is the truth, and the Word of God is what we live by. So when, when the media is propagating fear, because that makes good news, it makes lots of, and, and these people delight in it. I, mean, I have a problem, i got to confess, I have a problem with weather people. When there's tornadoes and big storms coming, they're like giggly little girls. On the, have you ever noticed that when they're reporting? You know, they get the TV for themselves. They get to turn off your show. They get to preempt your show. And they get on there and, oh, this is coming. That's coming. This is coming. There's one, uh, I don't know which channel he's on, but he's, uh, his wife is, is on it with him, too. So, so what's his name? I can't think of his name. Probably a good thing I can't. But he's like a giggly little girl in the storm storm. He can't hardly hold in his, his, and it's like, do you know what that's causing? I think death, destruction, people's homes, you know, destruction. But they got, they got their 15 minutes of fame. They're, they captured the time for a while. So I didn't watch them. I, I, I just turned them off. Because, because what, what's exciting about these storms? But, but they're there. They're there at every one of those things, standing in there, waiting boots, you know, while the houses are washing down the, you know, the overflowing floods. And, you, oh, there's a house going by. Look at how bad this is. There's a house going by. Well, how about the people that lived in that house? How about the people that lost their home? You know, what's, that, that's, but let's not make this news, but it makes everybody watch. They watch all this stuff. They're drawn to it. And maybe we are too, church. And when do we start saying, no, no, you know, I'm going to speak a good situation. I'm going to speak. They're speaking. The water's getting higher. The flood's getting worse. More houses are caving in. The, the fires in California, they're rushing through the mountains. And, you know, and it's getting worse. And there's going to be 100 houses are destroyed. There's going to be 100 more destroyed. Why not speak something different in that? <clears throat> My parents uh, lived in, uh, and they still do in, what's his name's canyon uh, in Colorado Springs. Um, but what's the guy you can never find in the pictures? What? Wallow. Yeah, they lived in Wallow Canyon. Thank you. They lived in Wallow Canyon. And, and my sister's texted me, you know, the fires are coming. She says, I've never seen anything like this. This is, this is like, you know, World War Three or something, you know, the... She says, all I can see is flames, and they're making mom and dad move out of their house. We're loading them all, all their stuff up in the suburban now, and we're taking them down to our place. And, and um, well, there, I don't know if you're familiar with Andrew Womack, but his college, uh, he's built a new one up in, in Woodland Park, but his original college, and where he has all his phone centers and stuff, are just over the ledge of my parents' house. That they're, My parents live on a, on, a, on a hill, a rock hill, and can actually walk to the edge of the Rock Hill and jump off and you're going to be in Andrew Womack's college or on the roof of his college. And I call up his phone number to see what they're saying about it. And they say, we've evacuated, there's a recording, we've evacuated our buildings. We're praying that this won't get us. Uh, please pray for a south, southwest wind to blow it back up into the mountains instead of on all these houses. And my sister's saying, oh, this is, this is like being in hell. This is horrible. You know, and I sent her a text back and I said, Oh, I won't get mom and dad's house because I just called it Southwest Wind and I'm in agreement with all of Andrew Wolfex's purity that there's a Southwest Wind coming to blow this thing away and it's not going to do all the destruction. And on the news, you turn on the news and the people are there and, Oh, this is horrible. Look at all these houses. There's my parents and everybody. You know, it's coming down and it's going to burn them all and all that. It didn't. It stopped about two houses up from their house. And, and you know what happened? You know why it stopped? Because the Southwest Wind. They would say, well, Pastor, come on. That's just a chance, right? I don't know. I, I don't know, but I know that that for me to say, oh, no, Mom and Dad's house is going to get burned. All the stuff they've saved all their lives is going to be destroyed. All their 
there's souvenirs, all the relics, all the things that are sold by them, they're all going to burn. That's what my sister, not a Christian, one of my sisters said she didn't have to be. They fed, they fed all that fear to my mom. And my mom, she's never really recovered from it. She's just full of fear because she was fearful that everything that she had her whole life was going to be burned up and just fired because my sister said, oh, it's coming down and they can't stop. Now, which would be better for me to, which would be better for me as a Christian to get old Pollyannish and say, you know, I think I can blow this wind and it'll come, you know, I think I can do that. Which is better? That's what I want to ask you. Because you can say, well, Pastor, you can be a movie and not be a movie. Which is better? Which should I speak? Should I speak what my sister's speaking about? Oh, this is hell and it's coming down and it's going to burn mom and dad's house. Or should I say, no, I'm not accepting that. Now, what if I had burned their house? Would, would anything I have said to, to force it, would that, would that have been any worse? Would it have been any, see, why not speak what God's word says instead of what the world is saying? Why not speak what his word says about a situation? Do you want to add to the negative part of it, or do you want to do what you can to add to the positive part of it? Sure, it might sound a little Pollyannish to the world, but this is his word. And he exalts it above his name. So, I want you to begin to think about what am I doing with this word? This precious, precious word. This precious word. Have you ever seen those those people that have uh, that you know their their boyfriend was in World War II or whatever it is and he's gone and now he's you know and he never came home and yet this 80 year old woman she can still get out all the love letters that he sent to her while he was over there, right? They communicated with letters while he was in France or whatever, and she's got this box full of love letters. Maybe he made it back safe. And what has she still got? The box of love letters. And she can show them to him. Tied neatly with a little beautiful ribbon and a little cheap box or something like that. Why? Because it was so incredibly important to him. She might even get an operator and read it. Maybe it's once a year or something. Our Father, our Creator, a part of His family, part of His lineage. He's written me a love letter. Honestly, what I can. I'm not being condemning, I'm just trying to get you to think. How important is this to me compared to the things of this world? I live my life, I breathe, I have my being because of them. How important is this? See, I'm 67 years old. I've been saved for 34 years since I was 33. And, and I'm speaking to you because I wish somebody had spoken to me 30 years ago told me the significance of this one. It's only been the last few years that I began to realize the significance of this one. The significance of his promises. How does a Christian respond to a situation? I will challenge you and say that most Christians respond as they in their mind think a Christian is supposed to respond. And as a result of that, we're not evangelists anymore. Well, I just love my neighbors, and I don't want to insult them, and I don't want to, I don't want to alienate them with the word of God. I'll just bake the pie and try and live like a Christian. I'll mow my yard. I'll, you know, I'll keep my cars washed. I'll try and be a good example of a Christian to them. But I don't want to, I don't want to start preaching to them because then I'm just going to alienate them. You may have just condemned them to hell. Because we are the instrument that God gave to, to spread this gospel. Even at the expense of our own rejection, our own life. He warned us. He said, they don't like me, they're not going to like you. They rejected me, they're going to reject you. The stone's either going to fall on them or they're going to fall on the stone. But we have, we have formed a Christianity that's apart from this word. We've 
formed a we formed a Christianity that well I, I'll just love them into the kingdom. The way you love them in the kingdom is not what the word of God says. Even even at the expense of, your, of, of possible rejection. The, the church needs to do that. You want to change America. You want America to go back to what it was 20, 30 years ago. You want an America for your kids and grandkids that that, that isn't falling apart and crumbling. Then we begin to take the word of God to the world. We begin to put the word of God above ourselves. So anyhow, let's go to the message instead. And uh, I don't think I'm going to get to Revelation, but I, I want you, I want you to see something. I want to talk about you know, the, the word of God in action that I've been talking about. The gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit. Now you're going to get to the, in the conference, the healing conference that you're watching on DVD, in, in a couple sessions you're going to get to, they're going to talk about the gifts of people. And, uh, or the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. And how those different gifts operate. It's interesting. I enjoyed their presentation. It's, uh, it, what's her name? Carly and, uh, and Daniel. They present on what that is. You'll see that a couple of you know, I'm just a little bit ahead of you guys, but yeah, I'm listening to them on my phone while I'm working. But, but they talk about it. So I thought, you know, I, I'm going to go to the gifts of the Spirit and talk to the church a little bit about the gifts of the Spirit. And we know what the gifts of the Spirit are and what, what they're about. But I want to show you something that you have not seen before. I know you have. Because it's not presented this way. I want you to see something. We're going to talk about the gifts in the few minutes we have left. We've got about a half hour. Is that all right? My niece, she's Catholic. We were at the hospital last night. And she said, uh, so you guys have church on Sunday? Yeah, we have church on Sunday. She said, so. And I said, oh, I'll be up until probably 3 this morning preparing a sermon because the Lord has changed everything. I'm not going to do what I was going to do. I'll probably get to 3 And I was. 2.46, actually. But, uh, but he changed everything. I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I gotta get home. Margie says, he won't need to get home and finish this. And so, and my niece said, she's about 30 ish. She said, well, how long did it take to put together a sermon? She's Catholic, she goes to Catholic church. You know. How long did that take? And I said, oh, it takes a long time. She said, well, how long are your sermon? I said, well, we're usually done about an hour and a half. Um, the whole service, about two hours, half hour, 45 minutes of worship. Or, and then about an hour ago, about an hour and 15 minutes of, of message. She says, now I know why I don't go to your church. And I said, yeah, you, you just want fast food Jesus. But anyhow, uh, <laughs> it, it's, you know, it, it's, uh, it, you know, this is once a week that we get to, if we get to influence the lives of, of you younger people. This old guy can still be influenced to some extent the lives of, of other people. And I don't want to put you with my experience. I want to put you with the Word of God. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, we're going to put that up there. That has been the kind of the landmark scripture on the gifts of the Spirit, right? And we'll talk briefly about that, but that's not the most important thing I want to talk about here. I want you to see how the church has misaligned itself with regards to a lot of these things. Now, this is a very controversial area, right? The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the power, you know, all that kind of stuff. And the, oh, that's not for today, syndrome, and all that kind of stuff. Okay, this is, this is one of the, this is one of the first scriptures I ever heard, because we went to a class at our Baptist church, and we took a test to see what our gifts were. You know, what are your gifts? Have you ever done that? You know, you fill out this form and determine what your gifts are. And, uh, and, uh, you know, I think my gifts was cooking chocolate chip cookies or something. But no, I'm just teasing. But, but it, it's really silly. I mean, it's silly that you would do it when the gifts are for the whole church. And the gifts are supernatural. They're not, they're not uh, neighborly kind of things. There's not wrong with those things. You know, don't get me wrong. That, that's a way to enter into somebody's world so you can witness them. But, uh, not against those things, but they, I, I mean, they had people they, when they got done with the test, there was people that had the gift of quilting, and that they could get together with their neighbors and quilt, and that's how they would share the gospel. The, 
get to quote them. And I'm like, I, you know, that, that's not what this is about. That's not, this is talking about the power, the supernatural power operating in the church. And we've walked away from that. We've moved it somewhere else. But I want you to see that's not what Paul was writing about at all. What Paul was writing about was the triune God, the trinity of God. When he wrote this, he was writing about the trinity of God. Is that interesting? He was writing about a monotheistic God to a, to a, to a polytheistic group of Gentiles. They had believed in many gods. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but look what it says. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, and you've got to understand that gifts was, it was added by, it, it says, now concerning spiritual things is what it really should say. Regarding supernatural things. Regarding the spirit and the things of the spirit. I do not want you to be ignorant. Now, we think he's going to, he doesn't want us to be ignorant about this, the gifts that are available to the church. That's not what he wants them to not be ignorant. He wants them to be educated on a monotheistic God and how it works. And you've not seen this before, but that's what he's writing about. I can fairly confidently say you've not seen this before. And some of you have been Christians for a long time. You know that you were Gentiles, right? It, this is a this is a a, a pivotal a pivotal uh, comment that he's making about what he's going to talk about for the rest of this chapter. He says, "Now, now that you were you know that you were Gentiles, carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led, however you were led, you went to this guy or that guy. They were a polytheistic group in Rome at the time." They had the Greek gods, they had the Roman gods. Um, have you ever heard of Pokemon? Has anybody ever heard of Pokemon? Do you know what Pokemon, you know where the root word is from? It's a Japanese, a combination of two Japanese words, and I can't pronounce them. But it means pocket monster. Pocket monster because there, there is a, a, a tradition, a, a religious tradition within Shintoism that, you know, Buddhism didn't come to Japan until the 6th century. They were Shintoists before that. And their religion believed that, that you had to have a more powerful God than, than my God. That's why we missed, a great, we missed a great opportunity of evangelizing Japan after World War II because they recognized that our God was more powerful than their God. And, 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 the, and the Gideons came to the American public and said, we need $12 million because for a dollar a Bible, or 50 cents a Bible, whatever it was, we can, we can evangelize most of Japan because they believe that our God is more powerful than their God and they want to know who our God is. The people wouldn't give them money. They, they, they end up with only a couple million Bibles to distribute. People wouldn't give them money. And you know what's interesting is the Japanese did discover our God. That's why the God of materialism has had such an incredible influence in Japan. Our God was our cars, and you go over there, they had still had 57 machines and all that right up and down the street. They became the car manufacturer of the world. They found our God. But the, the Shintus, the, the object is my God has to be more powerful than your God. And what I would do is I would carry a, a God in my pocket, a little God in my pocket, pocket monster, pocket demon, and I would carry it in my pocket, and I would, my God would have to be more powerful than my boss's God. If I'm having trouble with my boss, I would go get my best, most powerful God, and I would carry it in my pocket. So whenever I encountered my boss, I could grab my pocket monster and say, okay, pocket monster, you're great. And of course, the whole game in 1997, a young kid developed it, and, and it became a game of my my God, or my pocket monster, my Pokemon is more powerful than your Pokemon and all that. It's, it's, part of the, it's part of the pagan religion is what it is. And it's a shame that it overtook many kids in America. But it's all about pocket monster. Well, these people were polytheistic. And their goal was that their God 
would be more powerful than your God. So, so you need to have you need to have a God that's more powerful than the other God. So when Christianity came, when Christianity came, and and people began to manifest the miracles of God through the power of God in the church, then it was which which one of these people have a better gift than somebody else? Who has more spiritual power than than, than the next person? And where is this spiritual power coming from? See. Their bent would be to go to the polytheistic representation. Yeah, we serve Jesus Christ, but but I have this gift of wisdom. God has given me this gift of wisdom. And I it's even hard to talk about it as they would have thought about it. The gift of wisdom would have been their pocket monster. The gift of, of wisdom would have been my gift is better than your gift. My gift is more powerful than your gift. And they would separate them into gods. They would separate him into God. They would become the God of my life. Well, I have the word of knowledge. Well, I have this gift. I have that gift. And what Paul is trying to talk to them about is this all comes from one, from one God. This isn't a bunch of separate little powerful gods beneath the, 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 the superior God, God, Jehovah, Yahweh. It's, it's not him and then all these little gifts, which are all these little powerful things that different people have. Are, are you trapped with me here? Do you see what I'm saying? They were polytheistic, and they didn't understand that there was that, that, that there was one God, and He manifested Himself in various ways. They, 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 didn't, they didn't click with them. They had many gods. They were used to having many gods. They collected all kinds of gods. They had manufacturing companies that made gods, right? In one town they went to, Paul and Barnes went to, they were going to kill them because they, they were, the, the, it, was a, it was a center of a God manufacturing city where they made all these little gods. And what he's talking to them about is their polytheism. <coughs> you were led by, away by this. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus the curse. There is no, there is no faction in these gods. See, they're little gods. They're little polytheistic gods had various factions. And they would be like, okay, my gods will get together with your gods and our gods will be stronger. And see, you're saying, gosh, Pastor, this is so abstract. But to them, it wasn't abstract. This is their life. He was talking to Gentiles. And what he was trying to do is explain to them the monotheism of Judaism. See, the Jews understood it. They understood there was one God that manifested himself in all these different ways, in all these different powers, in all these different spirituals, spiritual ways, spiritual things. And it's important that we understand this because we need to understand where we think, where our thinking is with regards to these things because we've been, we've been impacted several ways. When I, when I began to speak about it, and I said we went to these spiritual gift classes and took these spiritual gift tests, I saw several people nod their head yes that they've done this. They've experienced this. They've gone to classes to teach them about what their spiritual gift is. There can be nothing further from the truth. <clears throat> because if I'm going to discover what is supernaturally empowered in my life, how can I take a carnal test to determine... It, you, you see how far off it is? How can I take a carnal inventory of my life to discover what supernatural bent I have? It's like oil and water. They, they absolutely don't have anything to do with each other. You can't take a carnal test to discover what's going on supernaturally in your life. It's two different worlds. Are you seeing? I mean, it, it can't be further. They can't be more polarized. And yet, in the church today, there's still. I, I looked on the internet. There's still all these these gift classes and gift tests that you can take to determine what your gifts are. And some of them were even Pentecostal churches. And I'm like, this is wild. This is just crazy. What have we gotten ourselves into? But some of you have been bent that way in your walk with the Lord. Therefore I made known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except for by the Holy Spirit. 
There is no other way. Now he's going to go into, he's going to go into explaining to them their monotheistic God. There are diversity of gifts, but the same spirit. Now, I want you to see how much he repeats himself. Now you begin to see, oh, I see what he is talking about what pastor's saying. There are diversity of gifts, but the same spirit. There are difference of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversity of activities, but the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit. This isn't a competition. That's what he's trying to say. This isn't a polytheistic competition among you. This has one focal point. This is, has one focal point. It's to the glory of God. It's to show his love to the world. It's not, it's not pitting my, my gift over your gift. Which is better, to prophesy in tongues or to give the intelligible uh, answer in English or the, the interpretation in English? Paul addresses that in 1 Corinthians 14, but anyhow. For one to, is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another word of knowledge through the same Spirit. Do you, see, do you see what he was saying? Do you see what he's trying to do? He's trying to line them up. These aren't different gods. These aren't different things. These aren't different little spirits within a different spirit. You got the spirit of wisdom and you have the... This is one God. It's all the same spirit. He keeps repeating this over and over and over again. And I would suggest that possibly you've never seen that. You've never realized that's what he's doing. But you had to absorb that first statement. You know that you were Gentiles carried away these dumb idols wherever you were led, however you were led. Another by faith, the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same spirit, to another the working in miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing each one individually as this is about monotheism versus polytheism. This was beginning to split the church up. Because who had the best gift? Who's got the best gift over here? I've got, I've got tongues. Well, I've got interpretations. Well, let's get together because if I've got tongues and you've got interpretations, we, we can trump the guys with just the healings. Right? The, the, you tell me that's not a natural tendency in the church. Tell me there aren't cliques in churches today where this group thinks, well, we're the kind of rich clique. We've got money. And we'll let in some of the almost rich, kind of the higher middle income people. We'll let those people in. They can be part of our clique. Well, we've got no money. We live in poverty. We're living off, you know, whatever. We don't feel comfortable with those rich people. We're out of our little clan. And poverty is better anyhow because, because, you know, we're humble and we're poor. And those rich people, they, you know, well, well, we have all this money so we can support the church and we can, we, we can really evangelize and we can do all these things. And we can, we can reach the rich that those poor people can never reach. You don't think there's, you don't think there's divisions like that in the church today? There shouldn't be. Thank you, sir. In fact, look what's next in my in my Bible. It said this: unity and diversity in one body. Unity and diversity in one body. That's the leading uh, that's the leading statement of the next sentence, it, the, the next text we're going to read, and and that's really not what it's about at all. We're, we're going to read this, and you're going to read it like that title just inferred. You should read it. Unity and diversity in one body. That's not what Paul's doing at all. That's not what he's doing at all. We're going to read this. Keep going and watch what it says. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of one body being many are one body, so also in Christ. Well, yeah, Pastor, that's what he's talking about. We're all part of the body of Christ. What are you, what are you saying, Pastor? No, 
He's using this example of, to these polytheistic people how you can have a monotheistic God that has all these different things because we are the body of Christ. He's the head and we're the body. That's what Paul tells them later in the scriptures, right? We're the body and he's the head. What he's trying to do is, is I wish I could almost kind of get down here. What he's trying to do is he's trying to, he's trying to say, look at the logic of it in your own body. Look at the logic of a monotheistic God that can do all these things and still be one God. And I'll give you an example. The example is your body that can do all these things, but you're still one body. Are you starting to see this? Are you, are you starting to, to, to track with me on this? Thanks, Kevin. Let me see. see, we've been taught, we've learned as Christians that this is all about the body of Christ. And it is. But that's not what he's trying to say. What he's trying to say is that this can be polytheistic Gentiles. This can be a monotheistic God that is all these different things. We're made in his image. And look at this. I got a finger. I got a thumb. They do different things. <coughs> the, the fingers can't operate without the thumbs. They can do certain things. They can point at you. But they can't pick anything up without the thumb. Well, not very well anymore. Can't hold on to it very well. And the feet save the head, and the head save the feet, and all that kind of stuff, right? Which we're going to read about now. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of the body of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. You see that? He's explaining to them who Christ is. He's explaining to them how we can have a triune God within the monotheistic belief. He's not trying to get us all together and say, oh, you're the foot, and you're the hand, and you're the head. That's not what he's trying to do. He's trying to convince these polytheistic people that there's a monotheistic God that's a triune being. Oh, Pastor, that's not how we've been taught. This is, this is your, your word. You're going with this. I'm going with what the Word of God says. I'm going with what it says. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink at one spirit, for in fact the body is not one member but many. You see that? He's trying to tell them, don't start getting off into all these little sects with your polytheistic thinking. This spirit is better than that spirit, and this one's better than that one. We're all one. Now, as it speaks to us today, that's good. Because we do need to see that we're all one body, and that we're all one functioning body. But it has not impacted the church that way. Or we wouldn't have all these different churches and all these different cliques. And we got the, the relevant church and the non-relevant church and the Pentecostal church and the, the, the evangelical church. And we got all these churches that we're supposed to be one body. And as much as this scripture has been used to try and do that, we are not one body at all. We are not unified at all. We're very divided and very decisive and, and divisive. And we're, we're, we're much different. And we're not supposed to be. There is no difference in here. There's nobody in this room that is elevated again above any above anybody else. Just as I pointed out to the to you at the beginning with the kids, I wanted you to see that. Each are unique, right? And we love them for their uniqueness. Each one of us in this room are unique. Because Sarah smiles differently than Natalie doesn't make Sarah better or worse than Natalie, right? She is Sarah. And Natalie is Natalie. And Natalie smiles a different way than Sarah. And Donnie is unique from Sarah and Natalie, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as it goes on, right? I took, I talked about, I, I talked about Daryl having his uh, almost what is it? Eddie Adams? What is it? Would it be? Yeah, not quite. And we talked about Eddie 
looking like the the leader of the one group on, and I won't say it, the one group on, on what was his name? What? Thorin. Thorin Oakenshield, yes. He's actually he was a good looking guy. I looked him, looked him up on my phone when I was telling the ladies. Nice looking guy. Oh, oh, he was the Oakenshield. Everybody's unique. Yeah, personally, I love each one of you for your unique, uniqueness. Maybe I tease you about it too much sometimes, but I love each one of you for your uniqueness. I don't put any of you above others. You're all you're all important to me. I love you. I, I absolutely love every one of you in a unique way. And I'm not even God. God is God. And he sees a uniqueness in each one of you that far surpasses anything I see. He sees the potential in each one of you. He sees the potential in each one of you. And as you discover more and more what this says about you, as you discover more and more the promises that he makes to you, he's not like a man that lies. That's what it says in the Bible. God is not like a man that lies. This is real stuff. This is real stuff. And your experiences will never trump the Word of God. Ever. First Corinthians 12, 15. If the foot should say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body, is that therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not of the eye, I'm not of the body, is therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole, if, if the whole were hearing, where would the spelling? But how, and how God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased, and they, and they were all one member, where what, <coughs> where would the body be? If they're all one member, where would the body be? You, you begin to see how he's speaking to these people about their different little polytheistic gods. He was trying to get them to the idea that then we're doing this thing together. We're working this thing together. This isn't a competition. I, I can't pass this up where it says that. My, I always remember Becky, my daughter, coming to me and saying, Dad, how come my feet, how come my, my feet smell but my nose runs? Maybe you've heard that a million times, but I've been there hearing from Becky. It was always very, she just little girl. She she, somebody told her that joke that day. I mean, she knew the difference. But now, indeed, there are many members yet one body, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again <clears throat> the head or the feet, I have no need of you, no, much rather these members of the body which seem weaker or necessary, those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor and run. Presumable parts have greater modesty, but our Presentable parts have no need, but God composed the body, having been having given greater honor to that part which it lacks, which lacks it, and that there should be no schisms in the body, but the members should have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all members suffer with it. For if one member is honored, all members, members rejoice with it. So now he's taken it from this whole polytheistic thing and formed us into the body of Christ and then brought us back to this place and saying, we need each other no matter where we fit this whole thing. And we need not criticize the less... He, he's saying that the, the less presentable parts should get the most honor. And yet, what happens with us? Some movie star gets saved and everybody's, oh, wow, you know, we're going to really change the world now because this movie star got saved. And this movie star, you know, it has come from a horrible lifestyle and, and, and has presented a horrible lifestyle to us before they got saved and now they're saved. And they, they typically push those people to places of honor too quickly. He says the most honorable people are, the, are the, what we would consider the most insignificant, the, most, the least visible, the least important. He says, well, what does he say when you get to heaven? Who's, who's going to be the greatest in heaven? The servant of all. The 
Now you are the body of Christ and members individually, and God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and after that miracles and gifts of healings, helps, administration, variety of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles. Do you all have the gifts of healings? Do you all speak with tongues? Do you all interpret the earnestly you desire to best you? Yet I show you a more excellent way. And this is way he's going to show you that the real central part of Christianity is when I close with this thought. 1 Corinthians 13, though I speak with tongues and with men and angels, but have not law, I become a signing for us or planning And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and all, I have all faith, so I can remove mountains, but have not love, I have nothing. And though I install all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long as kind, love does not envy, love does not parade itself, does not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, does not provoke, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in equity, but rejoices in truth. Wow, that's a huge one right there. Does not rejoice in equity, but rejoices in truth. If the church could do that in America today, if we could say, you know, this is horrible, what's going on to our nation, but we have a God that will bring us back together, we have a God that will unite us, we have a God that will bring us peace in our nation as we serve Him, as we return to being a Christian nation, as we evangelize people, as we're encouraged that God will use all these circumstances to do what? To bring people to Christ? Get bold. Get bold. Don't rejoice in inequity. Don't, don't get grovel with those people on Monday when you go back to work. Don't grovel with the, with the, the, the gossip and the situations. Don't go there. But rather what? Rejoice in truth. What's the truth? It's the word of God. The truth makes you free. Rejoice in the truth. Know what the truth is first. First know what the truth is. Though a thousand fall around me, I'll not be harmed. That's what, that's what it says, right, in the Bible. Though a thousand fall around me, I'll not be harmed. You know, they said that the biggest fear of the Russian army to ever go to a war with America, the biggest fear they had is that we all thought we were superheroes. We would go into a battle, as demonstrated in World War II, we would go into a battle thinking everybody else is going to die but not me. That's powerful in a war. That's incredibly powerful in a war because I go forward with confidence. I go forward with a determination. I don't, I don't fear. I don't, you know, back up a little bit. I go because I'm the winning team. I'm the winning team. Who's the most powerful Air Force on Earth today? What? United States. The A team, right? Who's the most powerful army on earth today? It may not be what it was, but it's still the most powerful army on earth. See, there's something about that that there's something about that I know I can win. And that's what the word says. If God is for me, who can be against me? Greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. Don't go forward with all the gossip. Don't go forward with all the woes and groans about what happened. Go forward with the word of God. And if we can do that unified, if the church can do that unified, then we're an incredible power here on earth. Greater than he that's in the world. Greater is me, he that's in me than he that's in this world. Though a thousand fall around me, I will not be harmed. How do you think David ran Israel? That's, that's the kind of things he said. That's how he ran Israel. He wasn't going to be defeated. He wasn't going to die. You know, when he killed Goliath, Saul was bemoaning the fact that there was only two swords in all of Israel. He had one and Jonathan had the other. He offered the sword to, to David and David said, I don't need a sword. Just give me a couple rocks and a slingshot. I'll take this guy down, not by my power, but by God's power. Not by what? Not by my power, but by the Spirit. If we can get back to that kind of thinking, if we can take God and put him back on the throne of our lives, 
and take food, fun, and fellowship out of the church and make this army a real army again. If we can get our purpose back, and it starts with you. It starts with each one of you. You have to determine in your mind, first I'm going to know the word of God, then I'm going to know his voice, and I'm going to know his will for my life. You have a purpose. You have a unique purpose. We just read that. Every part of the church, you have a unique purpose. You have a significant place in the body of Christ. you got to find out what that is. Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For you know not in part, we prophesy. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in the mirror dimly, but then in face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also. And love abideth, and now faith, now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. 1 John 4, he who does not have, does not love, does not know God, for God is love. 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. And maybe the most important scripture after John 3, 16, the salvation of Christ Jesus answered, he quoted Deuteronomy 6, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. How do we love? How do we love? That's the answer you have to discover for yourself in this world. How do we love? How do we love? I can't teach you that. You have to discover that on your own. I can't teach love. I can't teach you, Tom, to love Natalie and Sarah. You, you love them because you love them. You just love them, right? I still remember my son when, when uh, their first child was born. Uh, Jared's older sister, Chelsea. Her due date was their, their anniversary day. And my son was so upset. This is our special day. And she's going to be born on our special day. This is, this is, you know, this is our special day. And she's going to be born on our special day. They've been married for a couple of years. They've been married they have their anniversary in June. I go to the hospital. She was born on that special day. She was born on their anniversary. I go to the hospital. I get up to the father's waiting room. Go see the baby. And there's my son. He says, Oh, Dad, is this cool or what? She was born on our anniversary. Is this cool? Come and see her. Go with me. You see, she's so beautiful. Come and see her. She was born on our anniversary. Her birthday is our anniversary. Something happened. Now, I knew that was going to happen. And I could have told him that was what was going to happen. But once he experienced that love, then something changed inside him. Something changes inside of us with our children. Something changes inside of us. I just love to watch your faces when I mention something unique about one of your kids. And your faces just light up because you know that too. You know that uniqueness about them. And you, just, you just light up inside. And I love to see them. You've got to discover through a revelation of the Word of God, you've got to discover what love is. One day, loving somebody is presenting the gospel to them. Another day is praying that, that the, the, the bindings that keep them from knowing Christ would be broken. One day you're fighting the devil for them, the next day you're sharing the gospel. But you, you need to know what that is because it's love. It's love. You know, you know when your kids disobey, whether you're going to spank them or hug them and encourage them. You know what you're going to do. 
there's, there's a natural feeling. That's why alcoholic homes are so bad, because it just goes all over the place. There's a consistency in your, in your parenting. You know, with the whole thing, say, you know, and each child's different. His dad, I had to spank when he did something wrong. But I go into Becky, all I had to do was look at her, and she'd start crying. I didn't have to touch her, I never had to spank her. Because she knew she had broken some rule, and she had made daddy unhappy. His dad, much different. You know, he's the tough football player. You know, he always had the wrestling to the ground to get the face straight. Now he's great. It's that leading of the Holy Spirit. It's that intimate relationship with God that gives you direction in life. But you've got to know His Word. You've got to know His voice. And you've got to know His will for your life. You've got to communicate with God to know what do I say to this person? How do I influence them to Christ? What is God calling me to do? I was writing, I was, I was bringing uh, one of my grandkids home. Oh, we just got pizza on Wednesday night. We go to Little Caesars and buy pizza. I just bought pizza on Wednesday night. And I drive along. You'll like this story. I drive along. And I see a guy behind me on a motorcycle. And the Lord says, give him one of my cars. You know, Jesus, you know, his name is Jesus. I said, well, how am I do that? He's, he's, you know, driving his motorcycle. And he's behind me. And I think, well, we're pulling up this turn left area. So we turn up to the left. We're going to turn left on Pacific at 156. We're going to turn left. There's two lanes. If he gets in one lane, I get the other lane. I can hand him a car, right? And we get, we get, we get next to each other. But before, before we get next to each other, there's a car that pulls in in front of him. So he's one car behind me, and I can't get in my car. But the Holy Spirit's telling me, get in the car, get in the car. He's when do I get out? I mean, the light's going to change. And I, what do I do? How can I get, I get out? You know, I've got to get this guy in my car. He needs to be encouraged. He needs to know Jesus loves him. And, and so I said, okay, Lord, you got to work this out. I can't. I've got grandkids in the car. I can't jump off. You know, this isn't going to be right. So we turn it on to Pacific. I said, okay, God, this is your last chance. If this guy, if I'm supposed to give this guy the car, then you got to work it out so I can get this car. And he's in the left lane, I'm in the right lane, I'm going to turn right because I cut through this neighborhood to get to my house. I'm going to turn right. <clears throat> well, maybe the light will turn red and I'll be able to do right next to him again. And the light doesn't turn red, it turns green instead. And, and we turn right. And I say, okay, God, this guy's going straight, I'm turning right, you got to do something. He hurries, scoots, scoots behind me on his motorcycle, right? And he follows me into this neighborhood. I said, ah, Mark, that's, this is my chance. So I stop and I pull off to the side and, uh, and roll down my window and, and wave him down. And he pulls next to me. And I give him his car. I give him the car and he says, oh, thank you. I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. I needed that today. I just really needed to know that God loved me today. I really needed to know that. I went straight. You know what he did? He pulled into his driveway. He stopped right in front of his house. You've got to know his word. You've got to know his voice. And you've got to know his will for your lives. I can tell you stories like that all day long. I, you, maybe you can tell me stories like that. But you've got to have that deep, intimate relationship with him. You've got to know him. But I'm a sinner, Pastor. I do all these things wrong. He said, do not have a sin conscious mind. Put that aside that's been covered in the blood. Move ahead. Move ahead. I'm a sinner. I make mistakes. I do things wrong. I have the wrong heart about things. But you know what trumps all that? His word. His relationship with me. His character. His love for me that goes above my failings and my shortcomings. He needs you to be proactive. He has planned a system, designed a system that relies on his church. Whatever place you fit in that church, he relies on you to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think it would be wonderful if we could fill this pew with people like you. I love you all. 
But you know what I'd really like to do? Is fill these pews with people that have just come to know Christ as their Savior because you love the Lord God. I'd rather present Jesus Christ to people that don't know Christ at all and teach them about who he is than try and dig up old ground that somebody's going to believe and is going to sit there and say, I don't agree with that pastor. I don't mind you telling me that you don't agree with each other. I need that help. But I don't want to I, I, I don't want to battle with a bunch of people that have a bunch of old fashioned credit beliefs that don't line up with the word of God and have to go and dig those all out of me. Bring new babies. Bring new life to the church. Father, we praise you. Thank you. We give you the glory. We worship you. Above all else, oh my gosh, I love you. Oh, I love you, I love everything you are. I love how you treat us, I love. Oh, thank you for Friday night, and thank you, thank you, thank you. I was, I was so concerned that nobody responded, everybody responded. Father, I thank you for the unity in the heart of the church. I thank you, Father God. I thank you for the love. I, I thank you for the challenge that you may have placed in people's hearts to make up the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything I said that should have been said, just let them forget that. Only let them remember what you want to remember by the power of the Holy Spirit. Help them as me to be hungry and hungrier and hungrier for that deep and relationship with He who died for me to love me and be in eternal relationship with me. Oh, thank you. Great. Jesus' name, amen. Help us with the lost, Lord. Help us with the loss. Next week, we're going to get back into uh, Revelation. As soon as we finish that, we'll get back into Revelation.